Hey guys, how you doing? Uh, yeah, so my name's Josh. I come from Wellington, New Zealand. It's been my home there now for about six years. Oh, about six years. I've got a bit of a Kiwi accent on me, so hopefully you can all understand that. Okay, I'll try and I'll try and speak slow. I'm told that Kiwis speak really fast, so I'll try and speak a bit slower. Uh, yeah, so what, what else can I tell you about? I work for Catalyst IT. Um, there are sponsors here. We've got uh, branches in Wellington, that's head office, Auckland, uh, Sydney has an office as well, and we have another office in England. And we kind of do not just Drupal, we do uh, education, so uh, Moodle and Putra. We do bespoke software. We run uh, stuff.co.nz stuff in New Zealand, which is the second biggest uh, website in New Zealand, next to TradeMe, which is New Zealand's version of eBay. Um, and we, we do a lot of stuff with telecommunications in the past, and we do a lot of stuff with government being in Wellington as well. Uh, so it, it's a kind of a big company. Uh, we're almost at about 200 people now worldwide. Um, and I work in the Drupal team, which there's about probably about 40 of us worldwide. Uh, so today, I'm going to try and uh, give you guys a case study on a project that we did uh, it started actually back in 2011, and we just uh, went live uh, in August last year. And so it's, it's like it took a while, and it was a feat for us. And so today I'm here to present to you guys and talk to you about what we did with Drupal and how we did it and some of the lessons and things that we've learned from it. Uh, so I would s want to start off, actually before we go any further, I wanted to find out by a show of hands, what kind of people are here. So could you raise your hand if you're a developer? About the majority of you. Could you raise your hand if you're a business owner? A few of you around. Um, put your hand up if you are just here out of interest. I didn't mention you. Cool. I see that hand, hey? Site builder. Yep, okay. Cool, first lesson. I don't think you'd be able to build builders as a site builder. <laughs> But there's a lot of other reasons for that, but that's a cool. Thank you for coming. Um, cool. So a little bit of a background about SCMP. Uh, SCMP, they have been a newspaper company in Hong Kong since 1903. So it's a really old company. Uh, they're English speaking, even though they're based in Hong Kong. They target the English majority in there, and there's quite a strong presence of them there. Uh, and they are incredibly paper-focused kind of country. Uh, country company. So when I first uh, went to the SCMP offices, normally when I'm working at my desk, I have uh, you know, my computer, my laptop, my cup of coffee, and, and that's really about it, some headphones and a, a fairly you know, clean desk. These guys have stacks and stacks and stacks of paper, issues and issues and issues of magazines and newspapers all around them. The offices are covered in paper. These guys are completely paper focused which was kind of a surprise to me. I didn't really think that a newspaper company would be like that, but maybe that was just <laughs> some sort of uh, silly thinking of, on my part. But they had an incredibly strong paper culture. Um, back in the times of the dot-com boom, they kind of got a little bit hurt as well. So the, the whole dot-com boom happened and America and Hong Kong were charging up, putting everything online and making it happen. And they tried to go along with that culture as well and found that the model that they presented to the online web didn't work for them. And for a number of reasons, they, they kind of went a bit sour around online. And so paper was still working for them and they continued on strong with that. And so there was a, also a mentality that online isn't good. And as we know, that's kind of a silly think mentality. Um, so we ended up uh, winning a, a tender. They went out and researched the web. They decided that they needed a new website. They decided that they needed to give this thing another crack. Uh, they had an older website that was built on vignette, and they it literally could not hold traffic that they wanted. So every day, the site would, would be a, a slow hog during the morning traffic, as, as it happens with, with me media websites. And uh, it, when, when real news came along and people flooded to the website, it would just crash. And that was really interesting because they actually have a business model in place whereby you can't view the actual article until you've paid to be a subscriber. So there are people who are actually coming to the website just to read the headlines and still crashing the website. There wasn't that much traffic going through it. So they realized that they needed something bigger and better to help them grow their online strategy as a company. And they decided after looking around at different 
uh, solutions on the web that Drupal was a good fit for them. And they decided to go and find people in the Drupal community that they could ask to build the website. And so they looked and they found us and they found a, a number of other companies and they asked them to tender for building their website in Hong Kong. And uh, they gave it to us, not too sure the, the complete reasons. Uh, we do have, as I mentioned, uh, experience in building uh, media portals back in New Zealand. Um, we, together with uh, stuff at Coda NZ and Otago Daily Times, probably do about 70% of the media <laughs> online media in New Zealand, with New Zealand Herald being the other, the other uh, player. Um, we also have a fairly large Drupal team, probably one of the bigger ones in New Zealand. And we kind of considered the enterprise guys in that space in New Zealand. Uh, and we part ended up partnering with Rackspace in Hong Kong. They wanted to have a solution that was hosted in Hong Kong and they could, for, for, for performance reasons, um, so we had to, we didn't have an office there, we didn't have a data center there, so we, we partnered with them and we ended up creating a relationship together. Um, this photo here is a photo of us at the uh, Media Awards in Malaysia, which was in December last year, and SCMP took away uh, four golds and a bronze from the, uh, from the awards. Okay, so let's move into the challenges. Um, firstly, I'll explain the next number of slides are gonna have some pictures up on there behind the background. Uh, these are all photos taken off the website uh, from photographers and they have captions on the, on the inside there which are completely unrelated to the, to the uh, presentation. They're just there to explain the picture. Okay, so challenges. As I mentioned before, SCMP had an incredibly uh, powerful paper-based culture. Um, and so they worked in a print by design kind of mentality. What that meant was they had software called TCI News Desk, which would build their pages for the newspaper. And then pushing that content out to other sources was an afterthought. So paper was the priority, and then you would try and push that paper content out to other devices like onto a tablet or onto our website. And that was a real challenge because a newspaper, one single page, got pushed out into XML, and that one page could have one article, it could have two articles, it could have five articles, it could have half an article and a second article, the second half of that article in another XML page. It could also have like little teaser pieces that actually aren't real articles that you should ignore. And uh, there was also images and things that were associated with that which came as sort of a zip file. Uh, so it was incredibly hard to try and understand how papers work and how they don't work and how, how we had to sort of pull that information in. And of course it went out in XML and they tried to describe the data as well as they could. But journalists, being journalists, kind of decide to change things and they decide not to say, you know, this is supposed to be a byline text and instead that's where they put their name to say that they're the author instead of putting it in the author field and things like that. So it became incredibly difficult to understand and figure out things. So there was a lot of change in culture that happened at the same time to say, journalists, you have to use the system correctly. We can't just sort of do it willy-nilly. Uh, a second challenge that we faced was uh, scaling for viral news. Um, one thing about news media sites, especially when you're on dedicated hardware, is that you need to build an infrastructure that will last when you have viral events. You know, Michael Jackson dies or um, earthquakes in Japan. These big events, everyone flocks to news sites and you have to make sure that you can deal with that amount of traffic. But the infrastructure that you need for that is significantly more than when you're just operating in a sort of BAU f format. And so uh, historically, uh, companies have bought excessive amounts of hardware to try and make that work. And then you end up just sucking away power as 80% you know, of your infrastructure is not really being utilized. Uh, so we had to figure out an infrastructure that was um, a, didn't have to use so much of the structure and it could scale and deal with the traffic. An interesting thing, when we launched scmp.com in August, the Google Analytics showed that the, the amount of traffic instantly doubled the day that we launched. And I don't think that was actually because it was so impressive that it went viral and we instantly doubled. I mean, because it maintained that level permanently. Um, I think what ended up happening was that their system was so old and couldn't handle their actual current amount of usage that for half the traffic, they weren't actually getting surf pages when they were trying to go to the news website. Because, it, because the system couldn't even handle it. 
So for the first time when we went live, they could actually see and get a clear idea about how many people they were actually getting to their website. And since then, we've actually uh, gone, I think, 400 times over that uh, amount of page views in a day. And we haven't gotten alerted or been, you know, there's been no real problems. Uh, the third challenge was paywalls. Um, paywalls are kind of a big thing at the moment in news media. They're trying to figure out ways that they can make newspapers work online and still make money out of them. And so paywalls, everyone's looking in that space to see if that's the answer, if that's going to give them uh, traffic, if it's not going to give them traffic, and figure out how, how what's the right model for them. So they have consultants who will come in and tell them, this is the kind of paper you are, this is the kind of paywall or the kind of commerce model that will work for your website. And the way the SCMP were told to make their, their paywall was to provide a kind of metered trial system. So you'd see one article and it would, you'd be able to read it, see the next article and a notification will come up saying, you have read two articles, you have six remaining this month. And then you exit out of that and you read the next article and then you read two more articles you have now read four articles. You have two left remaining this month until you get to the end and it says, sorry, you, you can't read any more. You need to subscribe to SCMP. Here's how much it costs. Um, you know, step to the next step and you can read it. And the idea is to get people engaged and people, people enjoying that website and then they want to subscribe. And for the most part, it's worked. They, ha they have a lot of subscribers that come through. And for people who are just sort of passers by, they can use the site and not really notice that there's a paywall in front of it. And they took that concept from uh, New York Times. And uh, they didn't quite have the same budget as New York Times. Uh, so New York Times paid, I, I, from, from research, they paid $25 million for their paywall alone on the website. Uh, they paid us $46,000 US to do the exact same thing in 40 days. So we had a lot of challenges both from a project perspective um, and also figuring out how you can make this work without it making it too easy for people to get around the paywall. And the big lesson that I think the client really had to learn to understand is that if you want anonymous viewers to read your paper and apply a meter trial to anonymous users, well, you simply can't do it. Well, you can only just make it an obst obstacle for people to get around it. Uh, so. For those business owners out there who are thinking about doing a paywall, uh, if you want anonymous users to hit that paywall, they, we have to, as developers, implant something on their computer that makes, gives them a marker, right? And that's usually a cookie, or you could use Flash, or you could use local storage. You have to have a way of identifying who that person is for the next time they come back. Um, but because you haven't asked them to have any investment in that cookie, i.e. login, uh, then they can clear that and you, they just get as if they're a brand new user. So there's a, a problem there fundamentally with this concept, which is clear your local storage, clear your cookies, remove flash, you get in for free. So th that's still a fundamental flaw and problem. You have to have users invest some way into that session, make them want that session to be able to retain the amount of views that they have. But they found out that it was just too much overhead to have people logging in, th that they would just go away to leave the site if they had to do that and therefore uh, we couldn't enforce it. They did however create a reward system, sort of gamification if you will inside of the, of the, of the format. So if you, you could now, I think now you can read three articles as an anonymous user, then if you register you get an additional three for free and then they try and put the commerce model on you. So now you can uh, sign in and once you sign in then we've got your email address and we can email you and say, well, why don't you, you know, do this and do that? And if you don't come back, we can send you an email and offer some more free articles or something like that. Um, the other major challenge in this project was, oh, we've got a question. Yeah, so as I mentioned, um, we implemented it and it works, but it still has that fundamental flaw. So as, as, as long as being an anonymous user, as, as if you know how we did it, then you can get around it. 
and that's that's the uh, but I mean it, that's unfortunately the case for New York Times and you know who spent you know a magnitude of hundreds of times more money than we did, and and it's still a fundamental flaw. Didn't use the first free module, no, no. Uh, I do have uh, another slide about using modules a little bit in a further a further slide. Cool. Moving on. Um, so yeah, the the next challenge was data migration. Um, as I said, they had a previous website. It didn't work out so well for them. They had been running since 1992, I think. And the, so that was kind of a cool thing. They'd actually been archiving data since the day they went online. And that was something that they wanted to bring into the new system. In the old system, in their vignette system, they could literally not have more than 10 days of news articles on the website, and then it was too full. So they had to, every day, purge the 11th day of content and they'd put that into an archived system. And so they actually had this thing called the, uh, I think it was seven day index, where that was like, here's all the news on the site essentially, and you can go through it and read it, and that was kind of how they, they did things, but uh, it ended up turning into a feature. What was originally a constraint turned into a feature, and we ended up having to re-implement that for them. <laughs> it was interesting. But what I also wanted in this new solution was to bring everything since 1992 into Drupal. And that included over 800,000 nodes and 300,000 users and 85 gigabytes worth of data, um, which is incredibly hard to restore in your local environment when you want to you know, bring everything back up and try and work on a new feature. Because has anyone tried restoring a you know, 20 gigabyte MySQL database? It's a nightmare because, you know, <laughs> and if something goes wrong, you've got to start again. Like there goes four hours of your day. So, um, that was trouble, but that wasn't actually the hard part of the migration. The hard part of the migration was things like subscription data, where you know between 1992 and 1998 they had this model and they used the database in this way. And then after that date, they had a new model, but they kept the same schema. They just inserted the data in a different way. So you end up with all these kind of conditions as you're trying to migrate data, and and you know dealing with basically corrupt data and figuring out how you can import it. And so the biggest problem that we had with, with data migration was uh, exactly that. It was that there was inconsistent data and it, that caused headaches and problems. A question down the back? What database techniques? No. Right. Um, so the, yeah, the question was, uh, if I heard of a particular module, I've forgotten the name already, temporal databases. Uh, and the answer is no, I haven't. And I didn't try that method. What we ended up uh, doing was moving all the data into a separate SQL database. What was actually a separate set of tables that weren't Drupalized. And then, because uh, the other thing is, has anyone tried using the Drupal API, things like node load and node save, over 800,000 nodes, it takes a weekend. So you, you, you know, and if it fails, you know, if you want testing, you, it, it really is, isn't flexible. So we ended up uh, writing SQL queries and statements. So we had a bunch of, uh, we got all the data into a SQL database, then we did manipulation to make the data consistent, and then finally we had a set of SQL statements which inserted it into Drupal. And that's kind of the way that we had to do it. So we had to basically go through the back door because um, there wasn't anything, any other way that we could do it faster. So there's just a lot of headaches because you know, the, we would go through uh, into a month into the data migration project and we go, oh look at this data, it doesn't look right. And then you know, the, the guy from the, the project team will pop his head up and go, oh yeah, that's because of this requirement that we didn't tell you about. And, uh, and that's the kind of <laughs> problems that you, that you get. Um, so I was going to give a demo of the site um, perhaps we can do that a bit later on if we have some time. I'd just like to move on into the, uh, the lessons that we had. So continuing on from uh, data migration, yet 10 years of data is not consistent. Uh, we literally had 99 problems logged in the data migration process and we had a guy in our team called Daryl who fixed all of them. And uh, it was a complete nightmare for him, which I'm surprised he's still smiling. So uh, I, would, I would also recommend if you've got a lot of data like that, um, try and plan it as a, if you can, get away with it, a time and material thing. 
because we found the you know, 99 problems, they weren't identified at the beginning of, the, of that phase of work. They happened throughout the phase and it was at that, at that stage you had to go through change requests and things and we actually ended up just going to time and materials because they realized that the data had issues and we couldn't possibly scope for things we don't know about. So it just worked better if we could work that way. And once we had that, uh, that freedom, then we weren't uh, you know, constrained by time. You know, oh, we can't do this until it's been approved and all that kind of stuff. So it moved much faster once we went to time and materials. Face-to-face um, -face is better. It's really awesome that we can work internationally and do things. We have some advantages, like we can work in the morning before they wake up and get there, and we can do deployments before they arrive. So they can do a full day of testing and not wait for us to do a deployment because we've already done it by the time they come online. We also leave early, which is not so good for them sometimes because they want us to continue working or doing something. Um, and we can also do deployments at their outage times, not their, their non-peak times, and their our prime times, our working hours. So it kind of works quite well. But in terms of the project moving forward and moving at speed, we always moved the fastest when we were together. So times when we went over to Hong Kong or they came over to New Zealand, and that face-to-face -face environment, kind of like you know, if you're in an agile project and you're on a sprint room together, it just moves faster because you can ask a question, get the feedback, get the approval that you need to go ahead and do it. And you can think on, on your feet uh, instead of having to analyze something, put it in an email, send it across, log a ticket, that kind of thing becomes kind of tedious and you end up more in the project management space than you do in actually doing work in the project. So face to face was always better. Oh, we also had things in, in the cult cultural aspect that kind of um, changed things. Uh, if you ever do work in Hong Kong, um, the quoting system over there is like, uh, like in New Zealand, you sort of say, here's our price, that's, that's what honestly it's gonna take for us to do the work. And uh, they say, okay, or no. Uh, in, in Hong Kong, they, they say, well, we're gonna pay this price. And they sort of counter you. And, and when they're like, so we, we put out our price, like this is actually what it takes. And then they go, well, we want it to be less. And we're like, but that's what it takes. <laughs> and they're not, they're not used to that. So like, we had to kind of learn this because if, if, w if they pay what we originally said, then they feel like they're getting ripped off. And, and if, we, if we lower our prices, then we feel like we're getting ripped off. So you have to figure out a way of like coming to a, a good agreement. Yes, I have a question. Um, we ended up going with discount models. So uh, we said, look, this is our price. They said, no, we want to pay less. And we said, this is our price, but we'll give you a discount. Uh, and then the next time they understood that we discounted them for the last one and it's not gonna happen for the next one. And so we sort of mended the relationship that way, uh, rather than overquoting because it, it can, um, that's not really uh, ideal, I guess. Yeah, we, we, but in saying that, um, come the end of the project, there was a lot of unforeseen things. Uh, there was a lot of change requests logged uh, and we did come a, a over budget, we did go over, over budget. So um, we probably lo you know, lost out on a, on a bit, but in actual fact, we still, I mean, we still made profit. We were still successful in that. Uh, okay, so lessons. Uh, know when to write a custom module was a big one. We hit the ground running when Drupal 7 just came out. Uh, and if everyone can remember back to when that happened, there were still a lot of modules out there that weren't ready. I mean, they kind of had releases, but they had bugs. And that just kind of happens when you're using a brand new version of Drupal, right? Because until people start using it, people can't identify bugs, people can't fix stuff. So we were willing to wear that. We, write, we're like, we decided to contribute to that and help make things a bit more stable. And we did that in the process. Um, but unfortunately, along the way, when we reviewed a, 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 a contrib module and decided to try and use it, it often caused us uh, caused more problems than it was worth. Um, views was one of them, unfortunately. Uh, I know that this community really loves views so much so it's in Drupal 8. Uh, but in this context, it was actually bad. And the main reason was because we were using views the way that you would use them in Drupal 6, right? Which is you build your query and in the UI, you place all the fields and you render all the fields independently and you don't use view modes or node templates because they kind of sucked in Drupal 6. Um, but what that ended up happening is that while the query time could be kind of quick, 
uh, the actual rendering time would be really slow. And we ended up with uh, probably about 30 views on the front page, which is huge, right? No one has 30 views on the front page. And when you're doing that many queries and that much rendering time, it actually takes a really long time to get that out, and so we had a lot of problems there. And in hindsight, we'd probably use something like Gmode, which would have been much faster. In actual fact, there were um, views with doing stuff like, uh, you want to render this field? Well, I'll load the entire entity before I render it, which is kind of, I don't know, it seems pointless to me. Um, so adding the entity module instantly improved performance because we weren't loading things over and over again. We could just load them out straight out of cache. Uh, but panels was pretty awesome. So it was really lightweight. We pretty much removed blocks and used panels, and that meant that we were able to do dynamic layouts for every single page. Uh, and there was probably about 70 different templates that they handed over to us to build. And so we did that all with panels, and we were able to consolidate a bunch of those templates into a single panel, and it, that was a, a great win. So we'd use those again, and uh, we'd probably build some custom panes instead of using views in place of it. Uh, also, another one, uh, module, they wanted to do, well, one thing about paywalls and one thing about uh, having a subscriber model means that you have predominantly authenticated traffic and very little anonymous traffic. And y that's really important to understand when you're looking at it from a performance perspective. Because in Drupal Core, and Drupal 7, out of the box, you can get varnish caching for anonymous traffic for free, but you can't get that for authenticated traffic. As soon as there's a cookie involved with a session attached to it, it becomes a problem. That wasn't going to be good enough for us since the majority of our traffic was going to be authenticated. We didn't want authenticated traffic to take the site down. So instead, we had to create creative ways of making authenticated traffic cacheable. And that means doing things like abstracting the things that are specific to the user, we're like, you know, hello username, uh, and putting that into something else like a JavaScript ESI or Varnish or something like that. Um, and then that created additional problems because there are other modules out there that would do things like creating sessions uh, you know, out, you know, when you didn't want them to do it and it would slow down sites and stuff. So we ended up having that single constraint in place meant that there was a lot of contra modules out there that we couldn't no longer use because they were just poorly written. And so we ended up rewriting a bunch of them uh, to make them better, but the maintainer didn't want to commit the patches because they were too big. So we sort of just roll our own. Um, mega menu mini panels. So there's an extension that allows you to embed a mini panel onto a uh, menu item and use that as, as the mega menu for hoverovers. Um, what it does is print renders all the mini panels in the page load, embeds them at the bottom of the page, and then sends you the page back. Now, I don't know if you've looked at media sites recently, but they're all about really long pages. They want you to scroll forever. So as it is, you're already putting out a really large page. Now you're about to put panels markup at the bottom of it for each menu item, right? So like five or six additional ones and render everything that's inside of it in there as well, um, which is kind of cool. But the faster way to do that was actually to load them with JavaScript instead as an Ajax callback so that when you want to see it, then it does it. And you could actually do a late loading thing. We did a lot of lazy loading. So uh, you hover over it. And if it's not already loaded because it loads an Ajax whether you want it or not, uh, it'll just give you a buffer and then it will show up. And that was a much faster thing because not only are you not spending the processing time in your page to, to generate that, but you're also not sending that down the pipe hole. No. Because that module exists and the way that we change the code is so significant, we that, that patch just wouldn't fly in that module because we ripped most of it out and rewrote it. It does sound like something that we could definitely contribute back in some space. I've used it already uh, in other projects locally, so that's a good point. Yep. Do you have a question? The question for that was what other modules have we rewritten? Uh, another one, uh, and I wouldn't recommend using this module ever. One of the requirements was, <laughs> great way to deduce it, eh? One of the requirements was the user can only have one session at a time. Think about this for a moment. So you log on to the website, you can only have one session. So that user ID, that UID can only be on that one device. 
one of the old problems they had, right, is they'd pay for a subscription and then give their username and password out to all their friends and family, and they can all log on to the site and, and use that subscription. Uh, so what they wanted to do was lock it down to a single device. But that is actually quite a challenge to do uh, because what, ha what happens when someone else tries to log on? Do you kick them off and let them go on or do you uh, deny that login or you know, what's, th what's the logic that happens there? And then they also extended that and said, actually, we want to allow free because what, when, we when we launched, people started complaining saying, oh, but I've got a tablet, I've got my mobile phone, I've got my desktop computer at home, I've got my work environment. And they're like, well, okay, we can let you use X number of those on, on that website, I suppose. And so they wanted to expand it. Um, but the, the overall problem was that the session logic required you to, and the module we used was session limit, required you to create a session which sent a cookie, which prevented caching in the way that we were doing caching. And so it uh, basically meant that the user, as soon as they logged in or even visited the website, would just slow them down and it became a real problem. So uh, we ripped that module out and rewrote it. I rewrote it. I don't remember what I did, but it works. <laughs> yeah, we can catch up later on. Um, we also did some cool stuff with, with Chartbeat. Has anyone used Chartbeat before? Chartbeat is like, uh, if you've used Google Analytics recently, you'll notice there's now a real-time widget board. And you can see traffic hitting your site in real time. Chartbeat does this feature only. And it extends this using something called Newsbeat, uh, and that's specifically targeted towards newspaper sites. And so SCMP, they really wanted this, this feature in there, and, and they made us integrate it. And then we took a stance when, it was ta when we were talking about analytics and things that they want for analytics and said, we will not track analytical data because we've already got 85 gigs of data. We don't need it anymore. So what we did instead is we went back and queried Chartbeat and we qu queried Google Analytics for that statistical data and then showed that on the website. So if you go to scmp.com and you scroll down the page and look at the most popular widget, that's coming directly from Chartbeat in real time. And I originally had a a bit of JavaScript in there that it would actually update it on the page while you're on the page. But I realized, A, it's not really that useful because it's not on, it's underneath the fold most of the time, so you can't really see it, it changing. And I also happened to crash the server the same day I released that change. <laughs> Whoops. Um, cool. I'll move on uh, to some stats that we have about our project. So it went from May 2011 to August 2012. We're still doing work with them and doing iterative releases, but it wasn't until August 2012 that scmp.com went live, the new version of it. Uh, we squashed over almost 1,700 bugs. So we had a bugzilla system set up, and whenever there was a bug, either from our QA team or from them, they'd log it and we'd fix it. Uh, over 8,000 emails exchanged back and forth between the project managers, 18,000 hours spent on the project, 198 features delivered. So these aren't requirements, not 198 requirements, 198 features which contain requirements inside of them that we worked through and, and deployed. 70 pages of client documentation. What we did was uh, we hardly ever used the book module. So what we did is installed the book module and built the book under the administration section of the site. And that's inline documentation for the whole, for the editorial team and for the project management team and the, uh, the, the digital team themselves. Uh, we did some, a bit of training over in Hong Kong as well, showed them how the CMS works on the back end and how they can run it. Uh, 40 Catalyst staff were involved in the project in some sort of capacity, although there's probably about 12 core team members, 10 trips to Hong Kong. Um, three to 800 articles are imported daily, so there's not just the newspaper, there's also magazines in the newspaper, and some newspapers are bigger than others, so that's why the number of articles vary. Uh, we also bring in feeds from uh, Allied Press and uh, Bloomberg and these other news agencies as well. Quite a few Git commits in there. Uh, and our infrastructure runs 21 virtual servers on six physical servers. Um, I imagine some people might ask me why we used physical infrastructure instead of going to the cloud. Uh, and the key one went there was that we signed a service level agreement with SCMP to guarantee the performance of, of the site. And if you're running on cloud hardware, you can't guarantee the resources underneath you. So we wanted to be able to ensure it, and if there's a problem, that we could actually deal with it at the hardware level. So we went with physical 
uh, servers and put our own virtual layer on top. Um, there's over a million lines of code that, that we wrote, um, but that is predominantly features <laughs> and views and things like that. It sounds a lot more bigger than it really is. There were a lot of modules that were enabled. Again, that was a choice of how we decided to roll our features, and a lot of those modules were feature modules. Um, and we did 255 releases to staging before we went live. Pretty epic. So that's the majority of, of, uh, of my presentation. I'd like to open up the, the floor to questions. Hello. The question was, they're originally a print paper, and when they go online, do they keep the content from paper online as well? Okay, right. Okay, so how that works, how does the workflow process work in SCMP, I think is all I can provide as an answer, um, which is they use CCI Newsgate, that's their product for producing the paper, and journalists will have their own desktop, they will open up the software, which is a desktop application, and they'll type in their story and send that to the editor. The editor and his team are then responsible for choosing the articles to create, editing the stories, and placing them in the paper. They send that to typeset, that exports to XML. That XML gets sent over SFTP to us, and we import those stories, and they all sit unpublished in Drupal. Then what happens is they have an e a digital editorial team that come on board, they look at the articles, and they start promoting some of them to no queues to put them into the different sections, the to order them around the, uh, the page, and they publish, you know, they publish the ones that they want, and they will alter, because what happens is something that's a, a title in a, on an article in print is sometimes ambiguous, because they want you to read the article and find out more information. If you put that on the web, it's not what you're looking for, so you won't find it. So what they end up doing is they have a print head and a web head, and so they, they'll change that around and fix up grammar and things like that. So they have a dedicated team for doing that and they're kind of responsible for, they have the freedom, I think, to, to do that with the direction of the editor, but they, they still are responsible for doing that. And they have a team of about 21 guys that put the paper together. So the, I think one thing that I did appreciate about SCMP was even, because they are so paper focused, they do really care about content, uh, which as you know, someone who's a site boarder, I should probably know more about that. but kind of I'm interested in the technicals and don't really care about the content, they you know, put a team that's bigger than us who built the site to be able to manage the content on it, which I thought was really cool. Uh, they use CCI News Desk. There's CCI News Gate, which is a different product. I feel like I'm selling them now. They, they um, actually, and that's probably the better product. It just is really expensive in licensee fees and they didn't want to go down that path. But that will actually export articles in XML format rather than news type papers into XML format. Yeah, yeah, so journalists go there. They don't go onto Drupal. So that it's not actually the authoring environment. Oh, that's interesting. I'd say if you go to Drupal 8, that sounds good, good because you can actually have the authoring environment on your phone. But in Drupal 7, unless you can get a, a, an admin interface that does responsive, that'd be cool. Okay. In the back. It's not a multilingual site. So SCMP, even though they're in Hong Kong, actually are only um, English paper. 
and anything that's in Chinese or Mandarin, um, it's actually usually an image because it's something that they're advertising. Yeah. No. So what they, uh, yeah, back when we started actually, I don't think responsive was actually around, so it wasn't in the design. Um, and so when you go to it on your iPad, you'll find that you'll get the desktop website. And if you go to it on your phone, you'll get the mobile website, m.smp.com. Um, and so that's the strategy at the moment. m.smp.com is incredibly <coughs> compact down its headlines, and I actually prefer it because it's much smaller and, and works a bit faster. Uh, and I think on Android it goes to m.smp.com. Uh, they are currently working on dedicated native apps to download and work. Um, it's yeah, it changes a lot with these guys. They don't care so much about accessibility. They care more about uh, proprietary ownership. So because because it's so important to hide content from people, it makes it more less uh, less accessible. So for example, we have the paywall that will pop up and and hide content. Um, and there's these interesting things like uh, if you use, I think Apple has a e-reader type device where you can choose to extract content out of a website that doesn't support mobile and present it in a way that's a bit easier to read and understand. And that uh, was for a while uh, a loophole to abstract the content and not go through the paywall. So we had to figure out ways of blocking that out and then there's you know, all these kind of crazy things. So you end up having to to change the content and make it hard to access unless you access it in a way that you can control, um, which means you kind of send accessibi accessibility out the door. That's kind of fun. We looked at Open Publish. It was in Drupal 6 at the time. Um, and we didn't want to build on Drupal 6 because it's not future proofing. You know, by the time we release, they get a year of support and then it's insecure again. Yeah. So um, that was an immediate no. And the size of the project really meant that it needed to be um, bespoke in, in a sense in terms of we couldn't really use a, the base distribution to, to kick us off. Should I be integrating with Union Pay as a commerce gateway? Uh, no. So they wanted um, to integrate with a payment gateway called Asia Pay in, in Hong Kong, and or Pay Dollar was their their um, product that we used, and so we we used the commerce module in Drupal and um, yeah, built out all of the products and things, and integrated that into it, and then we built a custom Pay Dollar integration module uh, to the commerce module to, to talk to it. That was the only payment gateway that they wanted to work with. Please. Did we get any extra support and from the government or for some, some other entity to, to help the relationship in the project? Um, not for SCMP.com, um, but there was a trade and enterprise group, can't remember if that was government or not, um, that were interested in, in, in uh, helping us out develop uh, our business in the, in the Asian market. And so we are currently pursuing um, options with them to help do that. I'm not. A, I'm not working at that level, so I can't say. Um, but I, I think so. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're continuing the relationship, so it must mean it's some worthwhile. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. There's a lot of um, data feeds that go in and out of the Drupal site. Um, and yeah, they've, they've had this system in place for a very long time. Now remember, obviously, there are papers since 1903 and they've moved from having everything on file to into a computer system. And they, have all, they already have their infrastructure set up for dealing with paper-based subscriptions. And so they wanted us to integrate into that. Um, and the way that they've been doing it in the past and the way they wanted to continue doing that was through uh, synchronizing data feeds, which was terribly painful. 
Yeah, yeah. I think they use Oracle Finance as one of them. So if we if we sold a um, print and digital package together, we would give them the access on the website, and then there would be a feed that would at night time run and send uh, everything from the day over, and then they'd reconcile that. And then they'd send everything over from us that had you know, other ways of getting to the digital site and would reconcile that. And uh, yeah, so you, you run into race condition problems and what happens if someone does something over here and over here and all that kind of stuff. Um, we just had to kind of deal with it. So yeah, it's not the prettiest solution, but it works. Does that answer your question? Yeah, cool. Do any other questions? How are we doing for time? Yeah, well, cool. Well, thank you all for coming, and I hope this uh, talk's been useful to you. Um, we'll just call it there and come and see me if you have any questions. Oh, before I do finish, uh, we have a BOF session around uh, digital media. Is that right, David? Uh, and that's happening after this at 1 o'clock. Um, so if you're interested in that, come along and uh, we'll, we'll talk. Hi. Okay. What time is that? Okay. How do you feel about that, David? Yeah, unfortunately, I'm I'm leaving this afternoon. Yeah, so we could come to your uh, come talk about paywalls. Okay. So we'll go do that as well, and uh, until and it's a tenure room, and until one o'clock, um, before her, her talk, we'll uh, I'm free and happy to talk to anyone else about anything else around media, performance, scaling, paywalls, commerce, all that stuff. Thank you. <laughs>